you are Tristan Manuel Valdez. Yeah. Mr. Valdez, I'm going to ask that during these proceedings that you address me and that you don't turn around and address anyone in the gallery. Do yes. you understand? Yeah. So, Mr. Goldstein, um, Mr. Valdez, have you had an opportunity to read and review the pre-sentence report? Yes, Your Honor. Have you had an opportunity, Mr. Valdez, to discuss the pre-sentence report with your attorney? Yes. Are you satisfied with your attorney and the advice that he has given you? Yes. Mr. Goldstein, do you wish to explain or challenge the accuracy or relevancy of any information in the pre-sentence report? The only thing, Your Honor, is on the front page it indicates that he is under federal parole, and we don't know where that came from. Yes, I did see that, and I did strike that, so we won't strike that. Other than that, I think the report is <coughs> Does the pre-sentence report disclose any prior convictions in which there exists any known constitutional defect? No, Your Honor. The probation department in this matter has computed the minimum sentencing guidelines to be Uh, 34 to 67 months. Do you agree with that computation of guidelines? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Hartung, do you agree with those computations of guidelines? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. The court is contemplating giving Mr. Valdez a sentence that is in excess of the sentencing guidelines. Before the court passes the sentence, do you wish to say anything on behalf of your client? Yes, Your Honor. Um, Your Honor, I understand that the court is struggling with this matter because you look, particularly look at the pictures of the victim in this case, it's a, it's a pretty horrific situation. On the other hand, I think in order to be fair to everyone in this case, including the victim and the defendant and society, the court needs to look beyond the act itself. It needs to look at the entire situation in context. Mr. Valdez does not have a history of this kind of behavior. Uh, his prior, of all misdemeanors, I believe, there was a prior, it was a reckless driving, which really has no great significance. In this case, there was a, uh, uh, an, an R&O, it was charged as a misdemeanor, I'm not sure exactly why. In our conversations previously, it was referred to as a domestic violence, and that's what I thought it was, but it turns out the conviction was for an, either an attempt R&O or a misdemeanor R&O. But this kind of violence, this kind of behavior, is not consistent with Mr. Valdez's history. As part of the uh, course of this, of this case, a psychological evaluation was done of Mr. Valdez at the forensic center. And although there was a finding that he was competent, which, which I frankly agree with because I've been able to have communication with him uh, with regard to this matter with no problem. They also found that although he did not meet the statutory definition of insanity for, for legal purposes, for criminal purposes, that there were some serious underlying psychological issues. Um, I believe that, and I was looking, trying to look for it as, as, as I was waiting to find the exact language, and the report is rather lengthy and I couldn't find it. But there's reference in there to borderline personality, among other things. Also, Your Honor, and, and he indicated in his interview with Mr. Stevenson, that at the night of this incident, he was uh, high on drugs. You know, I made a comment in our chamber's conference yesterday that uh, it's unfortunate or, that there was no drug testing done on Mr. Valdez the night he was arrested, uh, the, night of, the night of this offense. Uh, I don't think that drugs are a major issue for Mr. Valdez. He doesn't have any uh, drug arrests. Uh, there's been no indication of heavy drug use, but on this particular night, if you put together his psychological problems, which have never really been addressed, uh, and the fact that he may have been using drugs with the victim, uh, that it, it may be helped to explain his behavior. Because out of context, his behavior doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I know that our prison system, first of all, I understand he has to go to prison. I mean, I'm not trying to argue for anything other than on the other hand, I also know that our prison system does not have the kind of um, programs that it used to have that could more adequately uh, address uh, the, the issues that Mr. Valdez is facing and will face without proper treatment. I'm hoping that the court will, in the sentence in this matter, indicate in some way to the Department of Corrections that he needs to be placed in a facility where he will have access to 
I'm going to say drug treatment also, although, again, I said I don't think drugs are a major issue for Mr. Valdez, but at least it's some counseling. And that uh, there are some facilities in this state that still have uh, psychological component, psychological clinic components, and would ask the court to, to ask the Department of Corrections to send Mr. Valdez to one of those. But I would ask the court to sentence within the guidelines. Uh, I'm asking the court to sentence in the middle of the guidelines. Because again, although it, it, the, the results of this act are horrific, and I'm not trying to downplay them or understate them, and I realize the consequences to Vanessa uh, are, are going to be severe, and have been severe, but I also think the court needs to look at the context in which this happened. We're not dealing with someone who is 100% stable, 100%, uh, I don't like to use the word sane because that's a bad word, but. I think the court understands what I'm trying to say, which is that I think there's some issues here that need to be addressed, because this is not the, the behavior that Mr. Valdez normally uh, and usually uh, comports to. And I would ask the court to take that into consideration in sentencing Mr. Valdez. Thank you. Do you have any preference whether you would like the defendant to speak now and then have, um, I believe we have some other people that wish to speak? I think it's probably appropriate for the defendant to speak first, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Valdez, this is your opportunity to address the court. Is there anything you'd like to say? That I apologize for what happened. That's really okay. If you could have a seat, sir, Mr. Valdez, Mr. Stephen uh, Gilbert, if you have the opportunity. <coughs> held in my arms as a baby and I protected it and I have done anything for it is the monster in this nightmare is still surreal. That night went for me telling you how much I love you and how I'd be lost without to you without you to getting up and running out of the house. Only to return an hour and a half later, literally with the devil in your eyes. Raising a huge knife walking towards me with the biggest smile on your face, as if you enjoyed the fear I started to feel. Like it gave you pleasure. I can still hear the sound of the blade going through my skull over and over and over and over and over again. A waterfall, a waterfall of blood pouring down my face drowned in me. I stood up off the floor and walked to the bed with the knife still in my skull. I looked through, I looked to see through the blood pouring in my eyes, my 13 year old son staring at me. I know it terrified him to see me so much that he ran to the kitchen and grabbed the kitchen knife in case she returned. Seeing him give me strength in that bag, I'd never allow you or anyone to take me from him. He's my only reason for living. I know it broke my son that was like a brother to you and once looked up to you. How could you try to leave him in this world with no mother? What were you going to do with the second knife you hit right across from his room? The answer to that kills me even more. Were you going to take your own nephew's life too after you tried to take your own sisters? It doesn't take a genius to figure out your premeditated plan, bringing two knives to my home. You put one right across from his bedroom where he was peacefully sleeping until you attacked me and the other in my head. The embarrassment I felt after not being able to shower myself, meaning help to even walk, my head being shaved, the physical pain I still feel every day, the sharp pain in my skull still feels as if the knife's still there, the scars that open up and bleed to this day. All uh, that doesn't trump the mental effects this has had on me. This has literally made me trust nobody. 
the paranoia, the feeling of needing to watch anyone and everyone around me, my own family, friends, strangers, the fear still inside me. I couldn't even sleep in my own bedroom anymore. It was a constant reminder just while trying to sleep where you left me to die. My children and I slept on the floor in my living room for six months until I was able to sell my place at once called home. Thinking that I'm finally leaving this nightmare behind me, or at least I thought I was, only to find out that this nightmare stays with me every day, everywhere. I relive it every single day, all day. I have to force myself to even get out of bed, force myself to even smile, and pretend I'm okay for my kids. But inside my mind is a nightmare I feel I will never wake up from. You literally thought you killed me. You only really killed me inside. You couldn't take my life or the fighter out of me. How can you have no remorse and no feelings? You sit in multiple court here and smiling and smirking like, oh, this is a joke to you. You're a true definition of a psychopath. I don't feel sorry for you. And you deserve every day and every minute you spend in prison. I only agreed to this short 10 year plea to protect my son from any more pain and suffering you have put us through. I couldn't imagine making him relive this a year and a half later staring at you, explaining what he had to see that night. You'd probably still be smiling in trial while he explained seeing his mother covered in blood with a knife sticking out of her head. I'm sure it would still be funny to you. This 10 year plea unfortunately did you a favor from face and life to a slap on the hand. But to me, protecting my son is more important. I beg you, Your Honor, to give him the maximum 10 years. And that still won't be enough for what he's done. But just to have some semi peace of mind that he can't get out and finish what he started. 10 years is nothing. He'll be my age I am now. His life will begin be beginning again at the same age he tried to end mine. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Herter, is there anyone else that wishes to speak today? No one else, Your Honor. Myself, perhaps, just briefly. I'll allow the defendant to speak first. Mr. Valdez, could you step back up to the podium with your attorney? Yes, ma'am. Well, that is, this is your opportunity to address the court. You already did, I'm sorry. Anything else, Mr. Goldstein or Mr. Mm -hmm. Just briefly, Your Honor, to, to summarize what I said earlier, I think sometimes in cases like this, we focus in too much on the results of the case and not what led up to, to the offense. And that's what I was trying to emphasize earlier. Yes, it's a, it was a horrific thing. She's lucky to be alive, and I think we're all glad that she is. But again, the court needs to put the whole case in context. And understand that this is not Mr. Valdez. Thank you. Mr. Hunter? Very briefly, Your Honor. The court, the court uh, is aware we filed a sentence memorandum asking the court to consider exceeding the guidelines in this case. And uh, the plea agreement that Mr. Valdez received here was a direct benefit uh, of the victim and sister requesting that her 14-year-old son not be put through the very terrifying memory of reliving this incident through top trial testimony. Um, we don't believe Mr. Valdez is entitled to a larger benefit from the plea agreement itself. And I think the court has had an opportunity firsthand to see the emotional impact this had on the family, as well as uh, Ms. Valdez's 14-year-old son. Mr. Gold, Mr. Goldstein is correct. This is as horrific a situation as possible. Uh, we have struggled mightily and fought back through our years and come up with, with no comparison uh, as to the magnitude of an assault with intent to great bodily harm injury that was imposed in this case. It is absolutely unimaginable and miraculous that she did not die. Uh, she is very lucky, but Mr. Valdez himself is very lucky that that did not occur. And but for the very, very hero-like actions of uh, Sean Sandy of the Hudson Police Department, there may have been two other people who have been very, very unfortunate that night as well, as we outlined in our, in our documentation. This is uh, a difficult situation for the court to weigh. Um, 
I'm always going to uh, side on the side of safety. I'm always going to side on the side of, of keeping a person who wants to harm someone away from the people that they, he wants to harm for as long as possible. And in this case, as long as possible is 80 to 120 months. Thank you. The record should reflect that I have received multiple letters addressed to the court from grandparents, people that Mr. Valdez has worked with, and family members, all expressing horror at the incident that occurred that night, when the nightmare that occurred that night, and also regret because of his history of being um, a personable person with no history of violence. In determining the appropriate sentence in this case, the court has considered the seriousness of the offense, your history, the principle of proportionality, the statutory penalty, the class of confinement, the sentencing guidelines, the report and recommendation of the probation department, and what has been set upon the record at this hearing, as well as what was summarized and stated in the pre-sentence report, along with the police report that was used for the entry of the no contest plea. Criteria and reasons for the sentence are the nature and the gravity of the offense, the discipline appropriate to its commission, deterrence against repetition by you and others, potential for reformation, vindication for the law, and protection of society. And people v. Lockridge, um, Lockridge states that when a defendant's sentence is calculated using a guidelines minimum sentence range in which OVs have been scored on the basis of facts not admitted by the defendant, found beyond reasonable doubt by a jury, the sentencing court may exercise its discretion to depart from the guideline range without articulating substantial and compelling reasons for doing so. A sentence that departs from the applicable guidelines range will be reviewed by an appellate court for reasonableness. Resentencing will be required when a sentence is determined to be unreasonable. Sentencing courts must, however, consult the applicable guidelines range and take it into account when imposing a sentence. Further, sentencing courts must justify the sentence imposed in order to facilitate an appellate review. The sentencing court may consider all record evidence before it, um, before it when sentence in calculating the guidelines, including but not limited to the contents of a pre-sentence investigation report, admissions made by the defendant during a plea proceeding or testimony taken at preliminary examination or trial, and in this case, this was no contest plate and police report was admitted. In this case, the actions this night were so severe and so serious, and he is so lucky that his sister wasn't killed. I, I, I don't see how she survived this. I've seen the photos. I've read the medical information that was provided. It amazes me that she survived, and I'm grateful that she did. There was admission made to the police department that um, when you left there, you were going to your parents' house to kill them. So I'm grateful that the officer in this case did take action and stopped you before they died as well. It's a sentence of the court on docket number 18-18841FH that you will serve 12 to 24 months with Michigan Department of Corrections. You'll pay $68 in state costs, $130 crime victim rights fee, and $60 DNA testing fee. In docket number 18-18842FC, it's an order of the court that you will serve 80, 80 to 120 months with the Michigan Department of Corrections. You will um, this court's order that you will receive psychological evaluation, treatment, and counseling while incarcerated. On count three, it's recommend or it's ordered that you will serve 12 to 60 months with the Michigan Department of Corrections. You will pay $136 in state costs on this docket, as well as $130 crime victims right fee. All convictions will run concurrent to each other. As a condition of parole, you're not to have any contact with Vanessa Valdez. Now you do have the right to appeal the sentence. My bailiff's going to hand down to you your notice of right to appellate review for each file. Please sign one copy for our records, the other copy is for your records. If you wish to appeal the sentence, you would fill out the information on the form and mail it to the address listed on the form within 42 days. Anything? 
Right. So it's all of the 294 days. Oh, I'm sorry. And there's 294 days for it. Would it be appropriate to, to expand that no contact clause to the victim's family and relatives? The victim and her children? Yes, her children. Not to make this family because that includes my clients. I'll expand parents, the no contact to include um, her children as well. Thank you, Ron. Court has received back a signed copy of the notice of right to appellate review for each file. Thank you. Thank you.